All righty. So today um, we're going to continue our discussion of the last part of chapter seven, uh, fundamentals of microbial growth, specifically controlling microbial growth. And today we're going to talk about chemical methods of doing that, including bleach. All right, so here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go over the learning objective. I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, halogens, alcohols, quats, peroxides. I'll have practice questions scattered throughout. And then we'll talk about what to do for next time. Okay, so today's lecture in this chapter helps us move toward being able to uh, achieve the following learning objectives, being able to define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology, identify microbial structures, and connect the structures to their functions, identify pivotal components of microbial systems important to human health, Analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. Okay, any questions? Any questions before we begin? Okay, if you think of any, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into the active ingredients in con uh, chemical control agents. Okay, so let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, so let us begin with halogens. Okay, if you look at the um, a periodic table of uh, chemicals, of elements, okay, uh, the halogens, and okay, we'll draw kind of a little cartoon of the periodic table. It looks kind of like this. Uh, your halogens are right through here, okay, right before we get to the noble gases. And so all of your halogens are through here, okay? So why do we care which column they're in, okay? Well, it's because it relates back to chemistry, back to chapter two, okay? It relates to what their valence electron shell looks like, okay? So, as a reminder, let's go ahead and talk about <coughs> the halogen that we talked about at the beginning of the semester, chlorine. Okay. Chlorine has, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer orbital or valence electron shell. Okay, so what it really wants is one more, okay? And all of the halogens are like that. They need just one more um, electron, okay, to fill their outer shell, okay? and give them a very stable configuration, okay? So all of the halogens really want one electron and they will go through and steal electrons, okay? So what that does is, let's say I've got a protein okay, and this is a part of the protein and it's folded into this shape and it's being held together Okay, by, I've got a side chain that's basic. It's got a positive charge. And I've got another side chain that is negative. It's got a negative charge. Okay, so this one has lost an electron. This one has gained an electron. We've also got OHs on the side chains that are forming hydrogen bonds. Okay, so all of these things are helping 
to stabilize the proper functioning shape of the protein, okay? So if I dump chlorine in, oops, that's a G, not a C, let me fix that. Okay, if I dump chlorine in, chlorine really wants an electron. So it will take an electron from a basic side chain and that changes it from positive to no charge, okay? So now this part of the protein is not gonna be attracted to this part of the protein, okay? Uh, if I get chlorine over here, it will grab an electron from here, okay? And it usually takes a hydrogen along with it, okay? So it takes that, okay? Um, uh, and makes this more negative, it's gonna have a harder time, especially if both of these are negative. Okay, there's another chlorine here. Okay, then these two are gonna be repelled. Okay, so halogens go through and they steal electrons and they mess up the shape of macromolecules. Okay, so they do that to proteins. They can do that to carbohydrates lipids, okay, they can disrupt lipid bilayer membranes, okay, and they really mess up nucleic acid, okay. So what are the halogens? Okay, I've talked about chlorine, which is the active ingredient in bleach, okay. So chlorine is uh, up here pretty high on the um, periodic table. Okay, fluorine is first, and we generally don't talk about fluorine, okay, as a, an external control agent, okay. Then I've got chlorine, then I have iodine, okay, and then I have bromine. And those, these three are the ones that you need to know for the exam, okay, because they are most, the most commonly used halogen Okay, as the active ingredient in um, microbial control products. Okay, so bleach is pretty straightforward. Okay, um, also if you work in uh, you know water treatment, okay, like swimming pools and that kind of thing, um, we have chlorine tablets that we can drop in to water that we want to. Uh, disinfect that we want to control the numbers of microbes in it. Okay. Also, when we talk about water treatment, okay, we use chlorine gas. Okay, so we just bubble the chlorine through there, we chlorinate the water. Uh, but the nice thing is with uh, when you're treating water is that chlorine will evaporate off, okay? So it gets in there, disrupts the macromolecules and microbes, kills them, okay? Most of them anyway. And uh, then it bubbles off and then you don't have to worry about it as much when you drink it, okay? Now, if you keep fish, you know that uh, you're supposed to take tap water and let it sit out to the air for an extra 24 hours because fish are a little more sensitive to chlorine than we are. They're smaller, it makes sense. Okay, so that is chlorine. Okay. Now iodine, it's a little heavier, okay? It doesn't evaporate off as much. So we use iodine in high level antiseptics. So if you're going to have surgery, they will apply an iodine containing antiseptic to the area of your skin where the surgical site is, okay, because it doesn't evaporate off, okay. It has a longer contact or dwell time. Oops, and I'm spelling well wrong. Yep. 
Okay. In other words, it stays on the skin uh, for quite a while because it's a bigger molecule. It doesn't evaporate off. Okay. So the longer it's there, the longer time it has to kill the microbes. Okay. By the way, contact time and dwell time, those are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Okay. All right. So we use iodine in antiseptics. Okay. Um, so, like I said, using it on skin for surgical sites, sometimes they will use it as a mouthwash before you have oral surgery, okay? And then also you can buy it for application on, you know, wounds, okay? All of those are antiseptics, okay? And unless you're allergic to iodine, um, you know, pretty non-toxic, okay? It doesn't bother us, it bothers the microbes. Okay, so bromine, our last one. So far as I know, the only use currently for bromine is for treating hot tubs, the water in hot tubs. Okay. And it's because it's an even bigger atom than iodine is. So you drop that into, um, a hot tub, okay, if you were to rely just on chlorine like you do in a swimming pool, because it's hotter, the chlorine will evaporate off faster, okay? So we like to use bromine for hot tubs. I think I put hot tubes. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't think it was supposed to have an E on there, <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, so, uh, you know, if you have a hot tub, you know about the bromine tablets that you drop in to disinfect the water, kill all of those skin bacteria that are coming off while you're sitting there enjoying the hot tub. Okay. All right. Questions about halogens. Okay, let's go back to the, whoops, I stopped share. I did not intend to stop share. I was going to do share another screen. Okay, yep, okay, I thought we were gonna do alcohols next, but it's always good to double check. Okay, let's talk about alcohol. Okay. Alcohols are any macromolecule, well, actually, excuse me, not macromolecule, organic molecule, okay, that has an OH hanging off the end, okay. So ethanol, okay, looks like this, okay, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl, Looks like this, okay? <clears throat> and how alcohols work, okay, is by dehydration. Okay, which is sucking out the water. Uh, so last time we met, uh, we didn't get a chance to get to dehydration. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about it now. Okay, so I've uh, got a cute little microbe here. Okay, uh, let's go with a gram negative bacterium. Put the thin layer of peptidoglycan in here. Okay, so I've got a plasma membrane. I've got the outer membrane, which is not showing up real well because I drew over the top of it. Let's go ahead and put the outer membrane on here. Okay, if I expose, okay, well, let's start out with how it's normally living. Okay, I've got water hanging out here. And I've got water inside the cell, okay? And with osmosis, okay, depending upon what the concentration of the salt is outside of the cell versus inside of the cell, 
I have water moving in and out of the cell. Okay. Now, if I add, and I'm going to put ethanol in here just because it's faster to draw. Okay. It kind of acts like a salt. Okay. It forms hydrogen bonds with the water. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and draw one going this direction. Okay. So I've got some hydrogen bonds going on. Okay. And so that causes the water to want to leave. Okay. It's more likely to leave and, and dry out the, the cell and to kill it because once I suck all of more water out, okay, the plasma membrane starts to pull away from the peptidoglycan cell wall. Okay. As I lose water, my proteins don't function very well, okay, because I've got to have a water solution to be able to move around and to have substrates uh, um, diffuse, bump into the active site, okay? So it pretty much kills the cell. <clears throat> now, also the other thing that alcohol does is it disrupts membranes. So you should try this at home, okay? We're gonna talk about soaps and detergents, but alcohol is actually pretty good for cleaning up fatty type stuff, okay? Disrupting lipids, okay? So um, say I've got some bacon grease, you know, if I take a little rubbing alcohol, it breaks up that bacon grease better than just wiping it with a dry, Cow or with, with water, okay? Water just kind of runs right over the top of it. Um, but alcohol is able to go in and kind of punch holes in these membranes. And that can lead to cells popping, okay? Now, alcohol also, it, uh, for some proteins, they can denature some proteins, but um, that's a less because you have to have two you, right? Like. So, um, so you can remember that it disrupts proteins, but I would definitely make sure you remember that it removes water, it dehydrates, and that it disrupts membranes. Okay. All right. How are we doing on alcohol so far? Okay, interestingly enough, um, 95% ethanol works better than 100%, okay? And I'll be honest, I don't know why, okay? So um, about 80 to 95% is the concentration of alcohol that you're gonna find in most disinfectants, okay? And most antiseptics too. Uh, you know what? I'm going to revise that because some, you know, you can buy a bottle of 70% rubbing alcohol. Okay. All right. So we find alcohols being used now that you know how it acts. Okay. Uh, you can find rubbing alcohol. Okay. Isopropyl alcohol. Okay, is a common antiseptic. Yeah. Start over on that one. Okay, so in other words, I've got a cut. I put some rubbing alcohol on there. I'm gonna knock down some of the skin bacteria that are trying to get in. Definitely it's going to kill any intestinal bacteria that are transiently on my hands. I know that's kind of gross to think about, but yes, we do have intestinal bacteria, fecal material on your hands transiently, unless you're in the, hand, in the habit of washing your hands for at least 20 to 30 seconds, okay? All right, so it's a good antiseptic, okay? 
Now it's not, we wouldn't use this if you were going in for surgery, okay? Because it doesn't have as long of a dwell time, okay? Okay, because it evaporates off. Alcohols evaporate into the air very quickly, especially these short ones, okay? So we use that as an antiseptic, okay? Um, and then we tend to use e either isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, or ethanol, okay? Uh, drinking alcohol, okay? Um, as a, a major ingredient in disinfectant. Okay. Relatively non-toxic to humans, okay? But, uh, you know, it uh, is good for use on surfaces, okay? So we tend to use it as a major component of, uh, of disinfectants. Also, it's a good solvent. So we tend to use alcohols in combination with other active ingredients, okay? So I'm gonna be bringing this one up frequently, okay? Uh, just because it's readily available, okay? Lysol disinfecting spray. Okay. Uh, it has between, well, it used to have 95%. They have since changed their formulation that now it's 80% alcohol. Okay. And also they toss in um, kind of a detergent, okay, to help it stay on surfaces for longer so it doesn't evaporate as fast. So it has a longer dwell time. Okay. But one thing you have to keep in mind when you're using um, ethanol containing disinfectants, okay? And that is, um, generally speaking, especially with how long um, they're used, and depending upon what else is in, okay? If it's just alcohol, okay? Um, it is going to be a low level disinfectant, okay? Uh, Lysol disinfectant spray is actually a high level. And it's because of the stuff that they've added to it. Okay. Uh, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to mention about alcohols before we move on to pots? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yes, Michelle. I'm sorry, can you say that again? What did you say? Alcohols are low level disinfectants on their own, but Lysol, because they add stuff to it, is a high level disinfectant? Yep. Thank you. All right, quite welcome. Okay, other questions? thought of something else that I was going to mention about alcohols and for the life thing, I can't think of what it is. So it must not have been very important. Uh, yes, Amanda. Um, I just want a clarification. So sure. um, in the book, there's a table for the low, intermediate, and high mm -hmm. for everything. And mm -hmm. you're saying that alcohol is a low level. The book is saying it's an intermediate. Once again, it depends upon how long you can get it to stay on surfaces. Okay, so my bigger question though is like your study guide though. I want to make sure I'm I'm getting it right for your study guide versus the book right. versus your expertise. Um, let me explain why the book says that it's an intermediate. Okay, generally when you're buying um, either antiseptics, okay, rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizers that are ethanol containing, they um. Okay, let me, let me do that comparison. Okay, rubbing alcohol is just alcohol. If I put that on a cut, it's gonna dry very, very quickly, okay? So it's gonna have a much shorter dwell time. And so rubbing alcohol is going to be a lower level antiseptic, 
Okay. Now, if I'm talking about Purell, okay, you have what we call emollients in it. Okay. Which is a fancy dancy term for lotions. Okay. Helps prevent your hands from drying out because we don't want to create cracks in our skin because, you know, that can lead to infection. But these lotions also keep the alcohol from evaporating. And so they have a longer dwell time. And so Purell is more effective in, in decreasing the numbers of bacteria on your skin than straight rubbing alcohol. Okay. So rubbing alcohol is low level. Purell okay, gets up to intermediate. Okay. And it's kind of the same thing. If I take rubbing alcohol and I rub that on a surface, because that's all I've got, okay, or I'm trying to disinfect a, a scalpel in an emergency situation, okay, that alcohol is going to evaporate off quickly unless I keep adding it, okay. Now, if, you know, like with Lysol disinfectant spray, because I've added something that's going to keep it from evaporating off, it stays on the surface for longer and it has a greater kill. And so it gets up to high level. So what the book did is they averaged. Because some of them are high level, some of them are low level. So they averaged them and they called them intermediate. Okay, so the low, intermediate, high all has to do based on the dwell time. Exactly. Yes. So um, it's good to remember the intermediate, but do remember that this is an average. Thank you. Ah, quite welcome. <clears throat> Does it, um, when it stays on, is it killing the stuff that's already on there or is it killing stuff that's landing on there after you've put it on? That is a good question, okay. It depends upon whether it's still wet when the things that land on it, land on it. So for example, with, um, let's use Purell since we've all gotten used to ethanol-based hand rubs. Okay? And I use Purell as a brand name. I mean, there's all sorts of hand rubs and they have pretty much the same thing in them. They may smell different. They may have uh, slightly different emollients, but they're pretty much the same thing. If you look at their active ingredients, they all have about the same amount of ethanol in it. Okay? Um, so while my hands are wet, if something falls on them, when I've got Purell on them, it'll get killed. Once I put Purell on and it dries, if I have something like COVID land on my hands, it's not going to kill that COVID anymore because the alcohol is gone. It's dried off. So did that answer your question, Michelle? Yes, thank you. Now with iodine, because it doesn't evaporate off, if something lands on that iodine that is on your skin, it's going to continue to kill because it's landed in this uh, iodine. And I say they paint it on you. Um, you know, you wake up from surgery, you look down, you've got orange all over you <laughs> around the incision site. It stays there for quite a while. Okay, does that help? Yes. Yeah. Didn't I have a, another, didn't we see somewhere where um, you were talking about the um the numbers of the of um of how many uh microorganisms the things kill which makes them um disinfectant sanitation you know whether you have high low intermediate levels of those mm -hmm. are those the same those aren't the same criteria that they're using for this low level intermediate or high level correct it is Oh, it yeah. Is. Yeah. Let's go over that again. Uh, let's see if I can find a spot. Uh, tell you what, let's just go ahead and clear the drawing. So let's go ahead and review that. Okay. So let's go with Lysol disinfectant spray. Okay. Um, 
one of the places where I used to work, um, we would verify manufacturers' claims. Okay, they would say, "Okay, I am a high-level disinfectant." which means that um, the, the benchmark that you need to make meet to be just a disinfectant is greater than or equal to three log and reduction of organism, okay? So let's say in this situation, I'm talking about Staphylococcus aureus because since we're talking disinfection, we don't have to use endospores. In fact, we don't use endospores because it's not gonna work against them. Okay, so I put a million of these guys in, okay? To be cleared by the EPA to be marketed as a disinfectant, okay? I need to go from a million, okay, to 1,000, okay? Which is 99.9% .9 kill, okay? That is a three log reduction. Well, back when we were testing Lysol disinfectant spray, we would use Staph aureus and we would put a million organisms in and we would get nothing out. And so that would make it a high level disinfectant for Staphylococcus aureus, okay? Um, we also saw pretty close to this. We didn't see um, a six log reduction because remember, a six log reduction I've knocked off six zeros. Okay. Um, when we were using Mycobacterium bovis, which is a stand in for the acid fast bacterium that causes um, tuberculosis, okay. uh, we would put in a million of these puppies. Okay. And uh, we would get, uh, oh, about 20 to 30 out, okay? So I've knocked off five, okay? So that was a five log reduction. That's approximate, of course, okay? Which still makes it a high level disinfectant, okay? Now, if I were using ethanol, I could just, well, straight, just straight rubbing alcohol and putting it on a counter. Because it doesn't stay on the counter as long, I'm not going to kill as many. So when we were um, looking at just straight whoops, rubbing alcohol, which doesn't have the clots to help prevent it from evaporating so fast, okay, I would put in a million staph aureus. And I would get uh, closer to 1,000 out, okay? So I can still call myself a disinfectant, but this would be a low level, okay? Did that, ex did that help? Yes. Yeah, they're both disinfectants, but because Lysol spray kills, reduces the microbial load so much more, they can market themselves as a high level disinfectant. Whereas if you're just using straight uh, rubbing alcohol, uh, then you, know, you would be considered a low level. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So it's just how much above three log you can get that determines whether you're a high, intermediate, or low level. Okay. Okay, shall we move on to quats? Quaternary ammonium chloride. Okay, now the, oh yes, Michelle. That was a mistake, sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay, the book uses a different abbreviation for this, which I, I'll have to admit, I don't remember what it is. Um, but uh, back in the day, we always called them quats. Okay, quaternary ammonium chlorides. Okay, um, they are a salt okay, that has a negative charge. Okay. So, in the they book, is it called quaternary ammonium compound? 
Oh, that's right. Quaternary ammonium compounds. They call them QAC. Yeah, it's probably because, well, they always end in chloride, though. I've never seen one that doesn't end in chloride. But anyway, yeah, quats, QACs, it's the same thing. Yeah. And so when you look at, uh, say, a can of Lysol, and you're reading down, you will hit um, uh, one, three alkyl benzyl ammonium chloride and, and uh, five, six benzyl, you know, and so it's this big, long chemical name, um, but they always add in, uh, end in uh, quaternary chloride. Okay. Uh, so anyway, they kind of act like a halogen. Okay. They're just not as good at it. <laughs> so they're stealing, okay, electrons, okay, from, uh, well, they have a hard time doing it on proteins, okay, but they are quite effective in uh, doing that with lipids, and so they're really good at breaking up membranes. So um, they are effective against some of these things, and uh, we don't ever use them as antiseptics. Um, they are, I mean, they're not terribly toxic to human skin, okay, because we've got this nice dead layer of keratinized skin. Keratin is a protein, so we basically have kind of a protein coat for our skin, okay. And we're constantly shedding that and renewing it. So you can use quaternary ammonium chloride, quaternary ammonium compounds, okay, um, on surfaces without wearing gloves, and it's going to be non-toxic. Okay, you're not going to get blistering or any of the things that you know. If you use bleach a lot without gloves, it'll start bleaching your skin, and you start get cracking and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Quats you can use all day and not have that happen. Okay. So they are um, non toxic to humans. Okay. I would not recommend drinking them, <laughs> uh, it'll clean you out and but good. Um, so it's relatively non toxic to humans. Okay. Um, they are excellent cleaners. Because they disrupt membranes, they disrupt bio burden. Okay? And so um, they're very good at uh, um, being a, a cleaner. Okay? But they are low level disinfectants. Um, so a good rule of thumb, okay, is the less toxic it is to humans, the less toxic it is to the microbes you're trying to kill, okay? Um, so we tend to see them in disinfectant wipes, okay? When you go to the store, and, uh, and I'm going to list these now out of order, uh, you look at Clorox wipes, okay? Lysol disinfecting wipes, okay? You will tend to see, if I remember correctly, about 0.25% uh, quat, okay? So you've got a bunch of different quats, you put them together, you add them up, and it's about 0.25%, uh, okay? And uh, so um, that's one thing to keep in mind, okay? The wipes have different active ingredients than, say, the bleach. Okay, if you look at the wipes, unless they say have they have bleach in them, but they've added some chlorine. Clorox wipes do not have bleach. Okay, Lysol wipes are different than Lysol disinfectant spray. Okay, um, because I'm gonna put you there instead of seats. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, just be aware, you know, that uh, disinfecting wipes are great for use around the home. Okay, in 
uh, office waiting areas, okay, areas where you're not seeing a lot of potential pathogens. I say seeing, um, you can't really see them because they're microscopic, um, but they're great for that, okay? You would not want to use them <laughs> in a surgical theater, okay? Because they're low level disinfectants. We want to go to intermediate or high, okay? Now let's go back to Lysol dis disinfectant spray. Okay, you've got a pressurized can and you have about 80% alcohol. And they tend to use ethanol uh, just because uh, it's uh, easy, relatively cheap to make. Okay? And then we add the 0.25% clots. So we combine two low level disinfectants. Okay? We put them together and you get a high level. Okay? By themselves, okay? this is low. This is low. We put them together and you get high. Yeah. Um, so you could use Lysol disinfectant spray in a surgical operatory. Yeah. We generally don't because we have other products marketed for that particular purpose. Okay? And they generally have a higher level of alcohol. Okay? Um, but if you are using <laughs> Lysol disinfectant spray. Do be aware that if you use it for long periods during the day, you will get a buzz, okay? Because you're breathing in the alcohol, it's gonna evaporate eventually. Um, so back in the day when I was working for this uh, company that verified manufacturers claims, um, we were looking at uh, products marketed to uh, the dental industry. And so in between dental patients, the dental assistants would have to go in, disinfect the operatory, okay, and get everything ready to go for the next patient. So they're in there, you know, uh, you know 10, uh, 15 times a day per operatory, okay, depending upon how busy the clinic is. And uh, so, you know, they would, tell us, hey, I've been using this Lysol disinfectant spray and it's giving you a headache. And it's like, yeah, you're getting a buzz. <laughs> so make sure that you have good ventilation when you use it. So something to consider when you use alcohol containing disinfectant. Okay. Yeah, and you know, you wanna be careful when you drive home. <laughs> Okay, questions, questions about quaternary ammonium chlorides, okay? How by themselves, they are low level disinfectants, which are just fine depending upon what you're trying to kill, okay? For SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID, okay? Clorox and Lysol disinfectant wipes are great, okay? They work marvelously, okay? If you have an outbreak of norovirus, Okay, which is a non-enveloped virus, which is hard to kill. Okay, these are not going to be effective. Uh, uh, the wipes are not going to be effective. Okay, Lysol disinfectant spray does reduce the numbers. Okay, um, also a, a one to five solution of bleach. Okay, you put one cup of bleach in. You follow it up with four cups of water. And so you've got one part bleach for five total volume. Okay. okay, questions. By the way, norovirus causes vomiting and diarrhea. Yeah, and it usually lasts for about uh, between one to three days. It is no fun. And it's extremely contagious. It is extremely contagious because it survives in the environment. Because it's not enveloped, it survives drying. Okay. Whereas SARS-CoV-2, because it's an enveloped virus, once the mucus around it dries out, that its envelope gets disrupted, or you take a Lysol or a Clorox wipe, and uh, you wipe down a surface 
the clots are gonna go in and break up that envelope and it's no longer infectious. Yeah, whereas you're right, norovirus is extremely infectious. <sighs> yeah. Because it's four years so ago, long. my son inadvertently at Thanksgiving took down four different families with it, including ours. I had a Thanksgiving like that. <laughs> Actually, two. <laughs> yeah, you get together, you know, and then you go home and then you inadvertently take it to your work. And yeah, it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. And uh, unfortunately, one of my neighbors, um, uh, you know, her, uh, her son and his family had been suffering from vomiting and diarrhea, but it was three days later, they were all feeling better. She felt fine going over there. They, <laughs> she came home and a day later, she's throwing up because the norovirus survived on the surfaces for about three to four days. <sighs> you gotta watch out for those nasty little guys. All right, let's go to questions. Okay, all right, let's talk about ethanol-based hand sanitizers like Purell. I should learn a different brand name. Okay, so which of these microbes from the scale of resistance that we talked about last time, okay, ethanol-based hand sanitizers are going to be good at controlling which of these. And there's more than one right answer. Okay, we've got some good voting. Ooh, we just broke 50%. Okay, we're at 78%, 85. Now, oh, there we go, 100%. Good job. Okay, so like I said, there's more than one right answer, okay? So the favorite answer was SARS-CoV-2 envelope virus. Okay, good job. It is definitely going to be effective against it because it's an envelope virus. It's easy to kill in the environment. Once it gets into your lungs and your cells, that's a different story. Okay, so the next favorite answer was E. coli, which is a gram-negative cell. Good job. They are going to be effective against E. coli, okay? especially since E. coli are transient on your skin. E. coli are um, intestinal bacteria. And so when they get on your hands, they're not really happy. They're really hoping to get back into your intestines. <laughs> so yes, they're going to be highly susceptible to dehydration from ethanol-based and sanitizers. Okay? Okay, the next two, which are, um, have a tie, okay, is rhinovirus and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, MRSA, okay? So Staph aureus is going to be fairly effectively controlled by ethanol hand sanitizers, okay? But one thing to keep in mind, Staph aureus is a skin bacteria. They are resistant to drying. Okay. Now, am I, gonna, am I gonna have you remember that on an exam? No, but um, Staph aureus is a little more resistant than E. coli, just because of where they've adapted, where they've evolved to survive, okay? Staph aureus, it's okay living on your dry desert of your skin, okay? E. coli likes the lush rainforest of your large intestine, okay? So when you, drop a rainforest inhabitant into the dry desert, they're not gonna last very long. Uh, rhinovirus, non-enveloped, yeah, unfortunately, ethanol-based hand sanitizers really don't do much for rhinoviruses. And by the way, rhino is from the Latin for nose. So it causes what we call a uh, head cold where it stays just right here. So fairly benign, but really hard to control in the environment, which is why the common cold spread so easily is because rhinoviruses survive in the environment just fine. Okay, and the least favorite, good job. 
hand sanitizers are not going to be effective against clostridium difficile. Okay? Or as the, they've changed the genus name, uh, clostridioides difficile. Okay, any questions? Feel pretty good about that one. You guys did great. And if you picked one that isn't effective, that's okay. We're still learning about this. Practice. All right, let's go to my next question. I'm gonna relaunch the poll here. Okay, wiping down surfaces with a one to five dilution of bleach for three to five minutes, so you got some good contact time, would be effective in controlling the transmission of, so go ahead and pick, there's more than one right answer for this one. Okay, hey, we're almost to 50%. Okay, ooh, we just broke 50%. Good job. 64, 71, 78. Oh, we're almost to 100. Keep going. There we go, 100%. Good job. Okay, our favorite answers are E. coli, good job. Um, bleach for one, three to five minutes is going to be very effective in controlling E. coli, good job. It's also gonna be effective in controlling rhinoviruses, okay? Um, they are hard to control in the environment, but this would be enough time to knock down the numbers to the point where most people are not gonna get a cold from it. Later on, we're gonna talk about infectious dose. Okay, so we will come back to this idea when we talk about infectious dose, but the, if you just get a few wires, your immune system can handle it, you don't get sick. And that's for most of us, okay? So good job on that one. Next favorite one, MRSA. That is also correct. Bleach is going to be very effective in disinfecting, okay? Controlling the numbers of MRSA. Okay, the, the second to the last favorite one is SARS-CoV-2, okay? Bleach is gonna be effective in controlling this, okay? So if a higher level disinfectant, okay? Um, well, let me back up. If a lower level disinfectant, okay, like ethanol is gonna control a microbe, a higher level one is gonna do an even better job. Okay, now for clostridium difficile, okay? Bleach for this amount of time is better than ethanol, okay? But we're probably not going to get to a three log reduction just because we're talking in this course. We would have to go 10 minutes. Just because endospores are really hard to control in the environment. But it is going to do better. Bleach is going to do a lot better than an alcohol containing disinfectant. Okay. All right. Any questions? Questions about that? So just as a review, I would say the right answer is E. coli, rhinovirus, methicillin resistant staph, SARS, and probably not clostridium difficult. Probably not. We need to up the time. We need to increase the dwell time. Okay. Give it a little bit more time to kill all those nasty little spores. Okay, let's see, we talked about what? Oh, let's talk about peroxides. Okay. Okay, now peroxides are um, a, a class of chemicals that has really exploded recently. Okay. So, um, the one that you're most familiar with is hydrogen peroxide, okay? So it's a water with an extra oxygen, okay? So there's lots of other peroxides other than hydrogen peroxide, but we're going to talk about hydrogen peroxide, okay? Just because we may or may not have that at home, okay? 
So what happens is this is a very unstable configuration. Okay, so it looks like this. Okay, and what it really wants to do is to get to this. Okay, and so if I have more than one of these, you know, this is in solution, this will break down into this plus this. Okay, so basically, if I remember correctly, you would need three of these to break down to this. Okay. Um, so in now, if it just broke down from here to here, no problem. Okay, but in the meantime, we get what is called oxygen radicals. Okay, we get these oxygen atoms. Okay, that have lost a hydrogen. Okay. Um, and they're looking for another proton. Okay, so they act like halogens, okay? but instead of stealing electrons, they still hydrogen ions. And they still will denature proteins. Um, and they will uh, break up membranes. and they will damage nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, okay? Um, so uh, we have disinfectants, okay, that um, have peroxides in them, okay? So they are used on surfaces. And traditionally, they were used as antiseptics. Okay, but we've gotten away from that because unfortunately, if you pour hydrogen peroxide on the wound, it tends to lead to increased scarring. Okay, so, uh, wounds. Okay. They still sometimes will put hydrogen peroxide in mouthwash. Now, I've used hydrogen peroxide containing mouthwashes and that uh, you get a whole lot of foaming. <laughs> because in humans and in a lot of bacteria, we have an enzyme called catalase. And it aids in the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen, okay? So if you pour hydrogen peroxide on a wound, you get a lot of bubbling. And as a kid, that was a whole lot of fun. And you almost hoped that you would fall down and, and scrape your knee because it was kind of fun to have the hydrogen peroxide on there. It would sting, but you got to see it bubble and you know, it was kind of fun if you're easily entertained like I am. Okay, and but when you use it as a mouthwash, you get a whole lot of bubbling going on in your mouth. And I don't know about you, but I just like that immensely, but, but. It is a good means of helping prevent periodontal disease, okay? Or if you have oral sores, it'll help clear those up quite quickly, okay? Because the release of the oxygen will kill or inhibit the growth of what kind of path, of what kind of microbe? It wouldn't bother anaerobes, but it would bother what? I think I said it wrong. It wouldn't bother aerobes, but it would bother. Microbes. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, yes, it would definitely bother the microbes. <laughs> but I was going for anaerobes, especially your obligate. Oh. I know, no fair talking about stuff from last week. <laughs> Why does peroxide mouthwash take off the top layer of my gums? 
you know what, it can do that too. Because even though we have this enzyme that will break it down, um, uh, you don't have enough catalase to get all of the peroxide right away. And it can start messing with um, uh, the, uh, the skin cells of your mucosa. So, so you something can replace I, it. Okay. So it's something I need to fix? Or well, I would talk to your dentist about it because some people are more um, sensitive to peroxide than others. And so if you're um, having a lot of gum tissue come off, that may be a bad thing that may lead to scarring. And so um, your, uh, your dentist or hygienist may suggest something different that will be equally as effective, but you're not losing chunks. Oh, mucosa. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, would I know what that is? No, I'm not a clinician. I just play one on TV. No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I'm not a clinician. I just worked at testing the disinfectants. So you asked me too extensive an, of an anatomy question. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, questions about peroxides. Did you say peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, like uh, attacks uh, aerobes? Uh, you know what? It doesn't bother the aerobes. The aerobes usually don't care but it's the anaerobes, the obligate anaerobes that will be killed by the oxygen that's released when your catalase breaks down oh. the hydrogen peroxide to, okay. to oxygen okay. and water. All right. All right, I was a little confused by that because I'm like, but I don't know, I, I guess in my mind, I thought that anaerobes were stuff that was more in your body that didn't really get oxygen exactly. And so I'm thinking like your mouth would be all aerobes, but um, you would think so. Yes. Yeah. But you do have an awful lot of anaerobes uh, in your mouth. Okay. So I'm going to draw my cartoon of a tooth and it's a very scary cartoon of a tooth. Boy, you can tell I didn't go to dental school. Okay. So you have your gums. Okay. Um, down here in the, the spaces between your teeth. And I'm showing quite far away, so I have room to draw. But as you know, from flossing your teeth, you know, your teeth are pretty close together. So you tend to have microbes, okay, that cover your teeth, okay? But you've got facultative anaerobes and aerobes on the top and they suck down all of the oxygen so that anaerobes can live in the deeper pockets of your gum, okay? And if they're allowed to proliferate, your gums recede because they're going ow, ow, ow. And so then you get these anaerobes growing down into the pockets and you get um, periodontal disease, yeah. And so um, you do have obligate anaerobes that are living in the pockets of your gums. So what do we do? We floss, flossing breaks up this biofilm, okay? Floss comes down, introduces oxygen. You rinse with hydrogen peroxide, that releases oxygen in here. And it, and it helps with gum, gum health. Yeah, but on your cheeks and the surface of your tongue, it's aerobes and uh, um, facultative anaerobes, aerotolerant hair and aero anaerobes. Yeah. Okay, did that answer your question, Amanda? Yes, it did. Thank you. All right, quite welcome. Okay, other questions. Okay, let me see what else I was going to cover. I think, yes, here is a good practice question. Let me pull up the poll. Okay, so you have a coworker that cuts themselves while removing glassware from an autoclave, an autoclave is a fancy dance and pressure cooker. Some of the blood from your coworker ends up on the floor in a counter. How would you clean up the blood spill? Okay. 
And for this one, in my opinion, there's one right answer, but there's the answer that they teach you that can be a problem, which is why I put it on here. Actually, there's two right answers. Okay, we're approaching 50%. Eighty-five percent, ninety-two. Let's see if we can get to one hundred. One hundred percent. Good job. Okay, the favorite answer is soak the blood with chlorine solution for at least ten minutes before cleaning up the spill. Good job. In my opinion, that is well, and and also. Uh, that is the, the best answer, okay? You're killing through the blood, okay? So remember, bile burden is anything that gets in the way of the disinfectant or sterilant getting to the pathogen, okay? So yeah, you put it in there, the chlorine will kill through the blood, and then you don't have to worry about exposure to anything in the blood. Um, the second favorite answer is wipe up the blood with clot containing wipes. Okay. This is what they tell you to do is get rid of the bio burden and then disinfect without the bio burden getting in the way of the disinfectant. Okay. But the problem is by doing that, by using a low level disinfectant, you're exposing yourself to whatever's in the blood. And even though envelope viruses like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, are relatively wimpy, the blood protects it. Yeah. So even though they tell you to do this, um, I would say no. Yeah, it's better to kill through the blood, reduce your, your potential exposure okay, to these bloodborne pathogens, and then you can clean things up. Okay. Uh, whatever you do, wear gloves. True statement. That is a true statement. Make sure you wear gloves. Okay. Uh, the next one is sanitized by scrubbing with soap and water. That's another one that they tell you to remove the bio burden. I would strongly suggest not because you're exposing yourself to bloodborne pathogens and the blood is going to protect the pathogens from having their membranes broken up by soap and water. Yeah. All right, I think I've got one more, one more practice question. Oh yes, this is the daycare question. Okay, I love the daycare question. Okay, so you run a daycare that has had an outbreak of diarrhea and vomiting in the children you look after. The physician that attends some of the children tells you that the children have been infected with Campylobacter, a gram negative bacterium associated with foodborne gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis is a fancy term for vomiting and diarrhea. What should you do to reduce or eliminate the numbers of bacteria contaminating your toys, blankets, pillows, carpets, countertops, restrooms, and diaper changing tables? Now, I did not have enough room to put the answer options with the question. Okay, now with this one, I'm, I like this question because um, you may not know anything about Campylobacter, but I gave you everything you needed to know to do well on the question by telling you about the bacterium. So if you see something like this on the exam, don't let it throw you. Okay. Let me know if you want me to go back to the, the actual clinical scenario. And there's more than one right answer to this. The, the right answer is E, right? Yes, sure. the right answer is E. No, <laughs> this is a good uh, example of what I call a joke answer. My intent is to make you laugh when you're taking the test. <laughs> Don't pick it. Okay, we're at 50. Oh, we just went past 50%. Good job.
Okay, we're at 78, 85, 92, 100% around the corner. There we go, 100%. Okay, the favorite answer was wash what you can with bleach, add it, add it throughout the pillows, soak the hard uh, toys in bleach solution, disinfect the surfaces with ice ball and get the carpets clean. All of this would be effective. Yes, that is one of the correct answers. Okay. The um, next favorite answer was to wipe down the surfaces of hard toys with a quat containing disinfectant. That would be effective. Okay. Wash the soft toys, blankets, and pillows, and get the carpets cleaned. And be sure to use to use, be sure to use ethanol hand rubs. All of that would be effective. That is also another correct answer. Okay. Um, then the third favorite answer was to use steam heat to sterilize everything. Okay. So steam cleaning the carpets. Okay. And using hot water to to clean. Okay. Would be good, but I'm just not sure how you can. Um, Steam sterilized countertops. Okay. So this is a good start. This would be a very good start for things that can't be tossed in a washer, but I would definitely toss some stuff in the washer or hand wash the toys. Okay. Because, you know, daycare center, everything's going in the mouth, <laughs> which is a good way to pass gastrointestinal associated pathogens. Okay, good job, everybody. And you didn't pick the don't worry, they've developed immunity, so don't worry about it. And you didn't pick the I hate kids. <laughs> so, yes, I do put joke answers on there to get you to laugh and relieve tension. Yay. All right. We are just about done here. Yeah, we've got two minutes. That's enough time to talk about what to do for next time. Okay, so finish the contents of the week nine lecture folder. Okay. Remember that the embedded tutor assignment number two is due on Friday. Okay. And start case study number three. It's not due until after spring break. And I should have case study number two finished before the end of spring break. And then next week we have spring break. Okay. So we're not gonna meet for class next week. I'm also not gonna be holding office hours. Um, I will probably be checking my email, but I'll be checking it in frequently. Okay. So any questions, any questions before we go?